I am here at Fractured Effects with its creative director slash CEO, Justin Raleigh. How are you, Justin? I'm doing very well. Thanks for uh, coming out. And we are here to talk about Swamp Thing, uh, the new series from the DC Universe. Uh, those of you listening to this interview probably know the character well. Uh, I, my earliest memory is when the first uh, comics started coming out in the 70s, Len Wein and Bernie Wrightson. Uh, is that your first exposure to the, the comic? Yeah, definitely. And then and really the Alan Moore stuff as well is really what got me into that character. And, and I actually hear that the Alan Moore comics uh, were more used as the source material for this series. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's correct. I mean, the overall tone is kind of in that Alan Moore world. Um, a few other names to check. Uh, the, the, the people who are involved in this, um, James Wan is the executive producer. Uh, those of you who are on the Stan Winston School site know his work from obviously the original Saw, The Conjuring series, and recently worked with Justin on Aquaman. Is that how you met James? Uh, James and I actually met on the first Insidious and we've done every Insidious project since then, and we've also done the entire Conjuring universe uh, as well up until this point, but we, before this, we had just completed Aquaman with him. So you have a long history with James? Uh, about 10 years now, yeah. And so why don't we just jump right in. How did this project come to you? Did James give you a call and say, hey, let's do something cool together. We're working on Swamp Thing. What was, what was that all about? We had just kind of completed some reshoots on Aquaman, and uh, shortly after, I, I got just this random email like, hey, what are you doing? And did a little response, and he said, do you have any interest in doing Swamp Thing? I'm like, really? For a feature? And he's like, no, it's a series, and it's a hard R, and it's a full-on horror setting. Like, and we want to do a full practical suit. Are you interested in building a physical suit for this and all the makeup effects? And I was like, well, of course I am. So, huge opportunity, amazing, uh, just a, amazing task, really, because it had been done before, um, and I just, you know, technology really wasn't there yet, budgets weren't there at that time to do something that I knew we could do at this point, you know, with, with all the assets that are available to us now. So, what made this uh, a heck yes? What, what, draw, what draws you to this title, this character, and this practical effects challenge? I think being able to take something um, that's so organic and could, with some of its elements and attributes as the character, could potentially become a CG character in a lot of people's minds, um, taking the task of doing a living, breathing character that has to be able to emote and have high levels of, of emotion, but then also look like a walking vegetable but with some human anatomy it's a huge challenge um, to do it well and to, to make it highly functional. Uh, and then working with James um, and the rest of the team, uh, was I knew it was gonna be a great opportunity. I knew that they would push it, they would try and take this to the most extreme level and push our work as far as possible. This couldn't be more different than 99% of DC's superheroes. As you said, this isn't a muscle suit and a cape. This is a, definitely a muscular character, but he is a living plant creature. Um, had you taken on a suit build like this before? Is there anything similar in your career that made you go, okay, I think we can handle this no problem? Um, we've done a lot of organic characters in the past, and we have kind of a history of developing very unique materials. Uh, like, uh, for example, we did a project years ago called Last Witch Hunter, and we had a queen character on that, and she had to look like she was integrated into the environment and looked very textured and webby uh, and almost cave wood structure-like. Um, so we had done similar kind of elements in the past, um, but I just felt like our suit experience, our knowledge of building suits, and um, our ability in the prosthetic world, I just felt it was a good challenge for us, and I knew my team would be able to put it together and do it. You mentioned a few moments ago that for the previous screen iterations of the Swamp Thing, which were not as successful, uh, they didn't necessarily have the know-how or the technology to pull it off. What specifically has changed in the industry that you felt 
uh, allowed this to be more successfully executed this time around? Well, I think a, a big part of it is, is time and budget with, with anything. I know on a lot of those projects back in the day, they didn't really have the money. They didn't really have the, the monetary assets to be able to do this big build. Um, DC was willing and Warner Brothers was willing to sit down and really develop this properly and give us the time to test elements. We did a, a I think we did six weeks of just R&D before we ever started building anything. So while we were waiting for casting, this is before Derek Mears had been added as, as our main performer, um, we just built internal suit elements, built components. We did a lot of 3D modeling uh, over uh, a similar sized actor's body form. So we basically built the suit in the computer, tested it in the computer, then tested prototype models before we ever hit the ground running. This is incredible for me to hear that you got that much time because more and more what you hear is uh, smaller budgets, uh, tighter time frames. Are you seeing a shift back towards giving uh, artists the time they need or is this a unique uh, situation? I, I think you're right in a lot of ways. There has been this trend for a long period of time where we've been given very little time and I think people are starting to turn back around and realize that you know if you want to do it right, it can be done right. You just need to give them the time that's necessary up front to develop it, to test it, to get everyone's eyes on it, to approve it, and understand its limitations as well. Um, but it also has a, lot, a huge amount of practical advantages on set of having a living, breathing actor in a suit in front of everyone. So I, I think overall the industry is shifting back and the education level of producers and directors are, are shifting over to understanding how to work with practical effects again, which there was 10, 15 years where it had really become a little bleak in our world um, and we were given very limited time with this. Um, but I think Swamp Thing is a perfect example of we tried to create something that is 90, 99, 95% an actor in a prosthetic suit, with prosthetic makeup. And then that 5% kind of skew with visual effects really kind of pushes it over the limits where we need it. But the goal was to have something that required very little visual effects. And they knew to do that, it took time to do that. Is this something, you said producers' education level in this area is getting better. So there's less having to, you know, let them know how to properly do it. Did you find that you had advocates in this particular producing team, obviously James had worked with you many times. Were there others who just really got it? And did you find that permeated the entire production? Uh, definitely, I mean, uh, Mark Verheiden had dealt with a lot of different practical effects shows, lots of makeup effects in his history, Gary Doberman, same thing. And James Wan and the Atomic Monster team, they all really have dealt with a lot of prosthetic work. And I had a very long history with James and, and a lot of success in doing makeup and character design for quite a few Warner Brothers shows with them as well. So just coming off of Aquaman and showing the amount of prosthetic work we had done for that and creature suits that we had created for that, I think that really helped sell Warner Brothers on that this is something that can be accomplished, it can be done well, we just need the time to do it. And um, James and team were, were fully backing us to, to make sure that that happened. And I'm sure your visual effects producer loved you as well because uh, contrary to popular belief, vis effects people love practical when it's done well because it gives them something to build on. They don't have to start from scratch. So what was that dance like between, you said it was 95 to 99% practical. When they did come in and augment, what, what was that experience like with the VFX team? Uh, I mean, they, they loved us because we're a house that accepts um, that symbiotic relationship between a visual effects company and a physical makeup effects company. Um, so we have 3D scanners, we have 3D printing, we have 3D modelers in-house. So when we pro provide an asset to a visual effects company, we're giving them exactly what it should be because we've done the scan, we've done the color correction on it, we've done the remodeling on it, and what they get is a pristine asset to work with. So when they have to work with it, they didn't have to rely on another house or somebody else to try and develop all those things. They're really getting the finalized part. Um, and then we were able to have early conversations on how we would collaborate together, what made sense um, on the bu budgetary point, where we both sit down and go like, okay, well this scene, what do you think? I think we can get it we, as in Fractured, can get it to a certain point. 
how do you feel about taking it over from here? And everyone would be able to chime in. We would talk through the process. And we had a lot of early planning, um, which is, again, rare in, in, in the television environment especially. especially. Um, but we were able to work that out several episodes ahead of time. I mean, the producing team, for the most part, we had a story arc all the way up until the final episode. Um, so we knew basically what was coming, and we had episodes up until four or five right from the beginning. So we could really kind of flesh out what we needed to do throughout the entire season between us and visual effects. And generally speaking, what were some of the things that you felt VFX needed to assist with in executing the character? There were some specific elements where maybe we wanted to see under structure start to tighten or constrict or move around. And we didn't feel that those quick little beats were worth building a puppet element for, which could be done. It was just a huge cost. And for a one second shot, it made more sense to do it as a visual effect. Mm -hmm. Or if something needed to rejuvenate, or we wanted a certain glow within the eyes, or some type of uh, textural regeneration or growth, it made sense to do that as a visual effect. Although there are many, many, many shots throughout the entire season where we had real puppets that were on set. Um, the first episode is loaded with puppetry. Um, not just for Swamp Thing, but for other characters in the show. And this, is, this has been a great opportunity because almost every episode had some type of puppet work, which is so rare these days and, and really a fun challenge to do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sitting here looking at the maquette. You guys can't see it, but you'll probably see a photo in this uh, interview. interview. Uh, it seems to me that you really have stayed very close to Wrightson's original design. Uh, can you share with our, our audience a, a bit about that design process? What was the, uh, I guess, the, uh, dog, the mandate from, from James and the other producers? What were they looking for? An exact recreation of Wrightson? A little different? What? How did that unfold, the, the design process? Um, the initial process, when I came in, DC had already done a few illustrations, and they were definitely based on, on Bernie's work. Um, so we had kind of a starting point of, of the tone that they wanted to try and achieve. Uh, James had a very, not a very different vision of it, but he really envisioned that there's nothing on the, the suit when you see the guy in the suit that really looks inorganic. Um, he wanted to make sure that it had multiple layers of depth to it. So the, the mandate that I gave to all of my illustrators, 3D modelers, sculptors, painters, everyone involved in finished fabrication with it, was that you need to think of this as like a potted plant. If you ripped it out of the ground and it's all kind of root bound together, you would see these layers of dirt and layers of bark and layers of small tendril tributary little roots and vines that are growing through it. And that's what we tried to accomplish within the sculptural aspect of it, was trying to create something that had many, many layers of depth. Um, the sculpting process, I think we went through, we actually tore it down twice. Not completely, but we stripped the entire surface and, and I had the team sort of retool it twice because I, I felt like it was looking too much like a classic creature suit and it needed something different within the sculpture to take it over the edge. So we ended up actually molding a lot of um, organic materials as reference and we would clay pour them and look, and look at them as, in clay reference. So root bound plant elements, dirt, bark, and a lot of the surface of it actually became real transfers of bark in clay that we put into it, something that you really would be insane to try and sculpt. So we you had a couple little sort of cheats for some texture by clay pressing um, real bark molds for some of it. But the idea was how do you get this viney understructure, which we, you would think of as like muscle sinew and vascularity, nervous system, um, and just all the tendons within the body, and then this exo structure that's a mix of mud and dirt and bark and wood, and all those elements kind of built on top of each other, and then how do you turn that into functional anatomy? So there was a lot of playing around and testing on how to make that look consistent uh, and look as organic as possible. So you mentioned that before Derek was uh, cast, you guys went through the process of designing and building, testing the suit in a digital environment. Once he was cast, he comes in for his life cast, 
And now are you going the traditional route? You're not 3D printing the suit. You're sculpting it in, I'm assuming, wet clay, uh, or it was, uh, oil clay, big old oil clay sculpture. Um, so you went the traditional route for that completely once you had your design signed off on. Yes, that's correct. So we, we did the 3D model, um, and part of that was to create a maquette, which we just discussed, and that was to present to Warner Brothers and to everyone as our approved concept design. Then we, once Derek was cast, we actually scanned Derek, put the, the sculpture of the maquette on him, remodeled it again to fit his actual anatomy and his facial structure. And we used that as our blueprint for a traditional build. Mm -hmm. So we actually did, we like to do um, a lot of like x-ray images. So we would do the 3D ZBrush model, put the actor inside it, and then do an x-ray of what all of our thicknesses are. So you can see him inside it, and then you can see the space that the, the clay would be representing. And that is our blueprint on actually designing it in clay. And then the reason we went with clay, one cost of 3D printing something at that size is, is pretty costly, but I don't think we could have ever got it to that organic level. And we wouldn't have been able to utilize a lot of the textures that we did and the sculptural process that we were able to use unless we did it in clay. It also gave us the opportunity to really kind of manipulate it on his body a little bit more in, in actual full scale, um, opposed to trying to look at it and understand that scale in the computer. And we find a lot of times, especially for things that are organic, it, using the 3D model and putting the actor into it as your initial blueprint is a great way to think out the process, how you wanna break it apart, how you wanna make it function. But then sculpting in clay traditionally still I think is a great way to go for the most part unless you're doing something that's armor or something that's super precision all of those type of elements we usually just 3d print mm -hmm. from top to bottom now I know it's a team effort but before we move on from design and sculpture and into the the later stages of the build are there any key artists that you feel should be uh, name checked either through that design process and the sculpture process uh yeah I mean it's a it's a takes an army to do this as you would know uh, my lead fabricator, who I think deserves a lot of credit for the engineering of how the suit would function and the final aesthetics of it um, when it came to organic textures, is Bernie Eichels. Uh, Bernie is a mad scientist and really thought outside of the box on how to approach this. Also, uh, Luca Nimolato, who was our initial um, conceptual designer, uh, he did some great work in ZBrush. Uh, Sam Pullen, who is our uh, in-house uh, 3D modeler and um, overall kind of tech genius, uh, made a huge contribution. Then our sculptors, uh, uh, Kodai Yoshizawa, Kelly Golden, um, Todd Rex, and uh, Charlie Hernandez uh, really put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into the sculpture. Um, and then beyond that, of course, our Brent Baker, our mold maker, our mold department head, his entire molding team, um, Brian Jones in the foam department, uh, and Steve Kuzlo seaming department, which made it precision, uh, and Julian Ledger, our head, uh, head painter, uh, and Claudia Hardy, our fabricator. I mean, that's, that's the core group of people that were involved with this. And uh, the last two that I'll mention is, uh, is Ozzy Alvarez and Kevin Kirkpatrick, who were our daily applicators for Derek. And if you missed any names, look to the bottom of the article. You'll see a full uh, Fractured Effects crew list. So uh, if uh, you weren't name checked just now, don't worry. Justin still loves you. Uh, <laughs> yes. So you mentioned foam. Um, you have a special consideration with this character, which is that you know he would be working in a wet environment. That proposes all kinds of challenges. Can you talk about the, the thought process uh, that, that you guys went through knowing that this thing would be playing in water? Um, yeah, I mean, coming off of Aquaman, we had done a lot of stuff in water, and that was a pretty amazing experience and really taught us a lot um, and gave us some, some new ideas on how to approach this character, knowing that he was going to be in water all the time. So one thing that we developed is... Um, it's a foam suit, which anyone that has ever done foam suit in water knows that it's a giant sponge. And initially, it's really hard to get it to submerge. Uh, but once you do and it gets saturated, it weighs a million pounds. It's, it's very taxing. So the entire suit um, is actually cord. 
and it has a perforated reticulated material inside. So only the surface is like a traditional sponge mm -hmm. of rubber. The rest of it is something that'll wick. So it'll actually drain rapidly. Um, so it takes all the weight out of it. Uh, another thing to help with function under all that weight is the entire suit is treated like a prosthetic appliance. So it is not a traditional suit sculpt where it's an upper lower body and a separate head with appliances. The arms are completely separate. Many, many components are completely separated, separated and broken up so you can deal with the shrinkage aspects of it to give better function. And then it's reassembled like a prosthetic on a undersuit basically. So very time consuming process to do it that way, but um, Derek will be the first person to say that it's probably the most functional suit he's ever been in. He can raise his, his arms way above his head, he can do a crouch, he can go in the water, he can do virtually anything with it and he's not restricted in any way. Um, so that was a huge goal. He also, it also breathes. So he doesn't completely overheat in the suit where a lot of suits, if you're buried in it, it gets very, very hot and you have to use a cool suit sometimes. This goes directly to his body and has areas to vent. So he can, he can cool down really, really quickly within the suit. So there a lot of initial thought in that initial design phase was how do we make it functional? How do we keep a guy that's gonna be in this 60 something days or more who, who knew at that point, how do we make it functional and easy to live in for, and, and really quick to apply? Our application time fully dressed on set, application of appliances was under two hours and that's fully dressed in the suit. And he was out of the suit within 40 minutes. That's remarkable. Uh, he, in an interview I read, said this was the Cadillac of creature suits. And you, Derek Mears doesn't need an introduction for our fans. He's been in every creature suit, many with my, my dad and his team and every other shop in town. And for him to say you built him the Cadillac of creature suits is a pretty high compliment. Uh, so. Let's just talk about Derek a little bit. Um, he's obviously a veteran. This character though, unlike I'm sure most characters he ha he's had the chance to play, has a, has a real emotional component. Um, I don't know how much of this is carrying over from the comics, but it, there's a romantic storyline here between him and Ar Arcane, Abby Arcane. Uh, I'm assuming that carries forward. And how, how was Derek able to emote through all this, all these layers of foam? That was a big concern from everyone involved at the beginning is, you know, he has a huge emotional arc and um, you need to be able to read that. So the appliances were, were actually made incredibly thin and designed to work with his own, you know, his own lines in his face. So the subtle little raising of your brow to get that sad emotion and get his eyes to look sad and, and let his face feel like it's drooping down in emotion, it all reads. And, and Derek, I think the first day we did a test here in house um, for Lynn and James and a few other selects, and Derek was just sitting in the mirror just blown away. He's like, the slightest little movement he could read. And normally you really have to you know, he's done this a lot and he's like, normally I have to kind of push it a little bit. I have to over, and you've worn prosthetics before, sure. so you know, you have to kind of overact a little bit, push your expressions a little bit to get it to read. And he felt like he was just uninhibited. He had no problems with the subtlest little movements. And our first real camera test day in North Carolina, um, Lynn came up to me and said the same thing. He's like, it's amazing. I can read the finest little movement in his forehead. This is incredible. And really that was just designing, designing based on his anatomy and trying to hit all those points and keep it as thin as possible. So it's a very subtle uh, appliance. It's broken up into four, five, six, uh, it's eight facial appliances and a cowl. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a few pieces. Um, and obviously new pieces every single day when he works with it, but giving that right amount of stretch and overlap and we actually re-sculpted a few elements um, two times, three times in a couple of cases to really get the placement right and take the stretch out of it. So he didn't feel like he was being pulled tight by f which foam can do. Um, and the reason we went with foam, uh, silicone would have been great, but shooting in North Carolina, shooting in water, guy in a full suit, having a foam suit with a silicone head, it just never really looks right. It, it never has the same level of, of um, photographic depth. So we chose to, it's a big green 
vegetable seemed to make sense to keep it all in foam but getting that tension right getting the shrinkage controlled was our main goal to get the function right any regrets uh, not taking a silicone route? I know there's a lot of volume on this suit. Your, were your Westworld suits silicone? Or are those also foam? The drone suits that we did were a foam base, but silicone impregnated. So there are elements that are silicone on the suit, and there is an, an impregnation of silicone, silicone that goes into the foam, so it, it treats the surface like it's silicone, but the base of it is foam to keep it light. So. So there was never a point though where you said, "Oh, I w the lighting looked it looked different." Obviously, there's a lot of musculature on that. This would have weighed so much as a silicone suit, so there was never any option. No, it would have been impossible to try and do that. It would have it would have been so taxing on him physically to try and do that. And I think just working within the environment that we're in, with high humidity, uh, and the nature of the look. I, I mean, foam if painted right. I mean, every single piece that we made was pre-painted in house, so we really put a lot of effort into getting it dialed in and matching before it went to set. And then it was just kind of final tie-in on set um, to save time in application in, in the chair, you know, opposed to having them paint it every single day. Having the time to really finesse the paintwork before it left here really gave that nice translucency that we were hoping for. He's always kind of wet looking for the most part. So that also gives a level of depth, um, which having something wet that's silicone, silicone wants to bead anything that you put on it, fake blood, any type of waterborne element, it'll just beat up on the surface. So it would have never really got that unified saturation of, of wetness to it. Um, did you have a backup suit? I know it probably took a big beating on, on set. Did you have a backup suit or two ready to go? Yeah, so uh, overall build, we had 60 sets of appliances that were planned uh, between Derek and his stunt double. Uh, Derek had uh, three main suits, three hero suits. So Stunt Double had three hero suits as well, hero stunt suits uh, that were made and tailored for the Stunt Double and his facial prosthetics were made custom for him as well. Uh, so we weren't using Derek's pieces on the Stunt Double. Um, and then uh, we also had water sections. So the lower body, we actually built four additional sets of just water suits. So specialized aqua suits, specialized lower um, pant areas. If it was waist deep, we could put them in just water suits that would wick even faster. They didn't necessarily have the same level of aesthetics to it because they're in the water. But if he was to breach the water and you saw his hips or part of his thighs, it looked like the same suit. But we did specialized suits just for that as well. Were those water portions still the foam with that wonderful core you developed? Or was it a neoprene base? Or what, what did you use for those the, the water uh, portions? Um, it was still a foam rubber suit with some of the same coring that went into it, but we did um, a bit of a silicone urethane treatment on the surface to help it wick a little faster. And then he had a, um, a thin, like one mil wetsuit that was integrated into it as well to keep him warm. And in some cases we had him in majority of a wetsuit. Um, if he was gonna be like first episode, he's completely submerged head to toe and he breaches out of the water head to toe. So with that, it was a hero suit that was just designed to go underwater and we had to weight him down underwater and have a diver nearby with a, with a breather um, in case he needed it. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of work developing something for water. It's that, that, honestly, that was the, one of the biggest challenges on the show was the amount of water work and what we had to do to turn around suits on a regular basis. So your question about having extra suits, it was a necessity just to have extra suits because it would take it would take nearly 24 hours to fully dry a suit. So you would, we actually built specialized ringers. Like I don't, I don't know if you remember in the shop, you'd have suit ringers, big squeegees. We built a mini version of that that we sent to North Carolina. So if he had a heavy, wet day at the end of the night, we would wring out the suit completely and then sanitize it, put it on the dryers, dehumidifiers, and then put them in a fresh suit the next day. Well, uh, it sounds like this is going to be a groundbreaking uh a groundbreaking moment for this industry. Some of the things you've discussed, you you incorporate into the suit, especially that coring method, uh, sound really groundbreaking. And f for anyone out there who thought that you know the advancements in practical effects were done, you're wrong. There's it's wonderful to see new things happening. Um, I have a question about some 
other characters in the show. In the trailer I saw, and that's all I've seen because this thing premieres tonight. I can't wait. Um, I'm seeing makeups. I'm seeing some cool stuff. Is there anything that stands out uh, as, as something Fractured super proud of beyond the, the Swamp Thing suit? Well, I think one of the elements that anyone that's seen the first episode so far it's, is getting a lot of hype is this sort of big puppetry element that we built, which from the beginning was really an homage to the thing. You know, we have an infected uh, character that's in the show. Um, the trailer shows him sort of standing there, frozen still, um, which is actually a full silicon body um, likeness of the actor. And then we convert that into a full puppet moment as well, where can't give all the details, but it, it rips apart and it has all these incredible puppet elements that are spilling out of it. Very much an homage to the thing. That was a goal. It's, it's honestly one of the reasons that I got into this, this industry was watching John Carpenter's The Thing and Rob Bottin's work on that. So having an opportunity and, and kind of getting the mandate of, of wanting it to be an homage to The Thing um, was a fun challenge of how do we do some new modern technology and, and still get that cool puppet vibe to it as well. But we had five puppeteers working that. Um, we, uh, you know, later in, in, in the episode two, you start to see more of Swamp Thing. We have some very cool elements, um, you know, where he's actually sort of tearing at himself and ripping elements of his body apart. And you know, as he's trying to realize what he is and what's happened to him, he doesn't have this understanding. So we did some really neat elements that integrated into a whole separate suit that we could rip apart and tear apart a part of his face and let him regenerate. Um, and then once we get into three, we start seeing this uh, bug man character. And um, you realize within that, um, Swamp Thing has, doesn't really understand his power. And by the end of the, the second episode, he has torn this person apart with his powers. You know, the swamp just rips and shreds this person. But his energy and his emotion and, and his sort of pain behind what he's done also creates something else within the swamp because he doesn't understand his powers and the swamp regenerates this body and pulls it back together and we have this whole sort of puppet rig that pulls this body back together and it's completely infused with plant life and bugs and maggots and all the little swamp critters that you can imagine so you have this human sack basically that's just filled with all these festering little bugs that's moving around. And that's our, our first kind of big makeup element that you've really seen. And we've had virus elements and a few other things that we've seen up until this point, but that's our real big head to toe prosthetic element that you'll see in episode three. I can feel the excitement when you talk about the puppet stuff. I really can. And, uh, and you're right that that to some degree has gone away. Uh, but, you know, rods are easier than ever to remove. And I'm assuming there's a lot of rod puppetry involved. Did you see the uh, creators a as these effects were coming together? Did you see them also getting excited and starting to write in maybe more gags or were all the gags set at the beginning of the season? No, 100%. I think once they saw um, how successful the puppetry was and how, how many different places they could try and utilize it, like we had a lot of functional vine puppetry, um, they kept trying to plug it in wherever they could. Um, because it, it was it saved a huge amount of money within visual effects and visual effects is still incredibly expensive and to have something that can interact with one of the actors or an element within the scene it's very hard to do that with visual effects you know where you actually have wardrobe that's getting pulled or someone's leg that's getting pulled or something getting knocked off the table you know, there's a lot of of course tricks that you can do to that but having an element that they could build off of in the scene was very, very important to the producers at that point. So we, almost every episode started getting some puppet element being added to it, which is awesome to have. And just, it's a, it's a great challenge to build these big, full animated creature elements, um, which we don't have a lot of opportunities to do. I think um, we're one of the companies that still does quite a bit of animatronics, and we've been really trying to push to get those elements back in, into the world again. I'm just happy to see that more of it is really starting to come up and we're getting more requests for it. Not just because of Swamp Thing, but just in general, I think there's a resurgence of wanting functional elements on set and, and just adding a little bit of visual effects to it. I think 
the directors feel more comfortable with it if they if they're used to shooting with it. Um, but it, it just gives them something to react to, something to work with, something that they can direct, opposed to waiting until the very end in editorial and then trying to figure out how do you direct your VFX team on on this thing that exists in the computer. So it's it's nice to see it coming back, and uh, I hope more continues. Uh, final final question. Um, you, you mentioned having something on set just is a great benefit for the, the filmmakers to, to see what they're working with before post-production. They have something to play with. But for the actors as well, to have that, that thing to react to. And as we talked about earlier, Swamp Thing is an emotional character uh, who develops a relationship. So what was the feedback you were getting from uh, Derek's fellow actors about having him on set and the other elements on set? Were you getting feedback? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, all of the actors were, I, I think, blown away. And I, and I think they all, I think none of them had really worked with that amount of prosthetic work before or puppetry before. Um, they were all really excited and they were all very impressed that that we were going that route because it did give them something to, to have right there to react to, to, inter to, to interact with. Um, and they also, with some of the puppets, got to puppeteer themselves a little bit. So that was very exciting for them to get to play. Um, but I, I think when it came to all the prosthetics and having that detail right in front of them, it, it really helped the emotional levels within their characters. Well, that wraps it up, Justin. Uh, I can tell you that our crowd uh, will be watching every episode. I know I will be. Uh, Swamp Thing is one of the most unique superheroes to come out of the DC universe, certainly. And from what I'm seeing here, just in this maquette, you guys really nailed it. And I can't wait to see Derek in action. You guys can check this out on the DC Universe streaming service. Uh, and I know you're going to love it. Leave comments uh, in the below, below this article. Let us know what you think. And Justin, final question to you. Uh, it seems like things are moving back in the right direction. But what do you see being the future of practical effects in filmed entertainment? Wow, that's a tough question to end with. Um, no, I, I mean, I think there is a big paradigm shift into going back into the physical makeup effects builds and creature effects builds. And I think we're going to see more of that. I think with the technology that we all have available to us as, as makeup effects artists and designers now, um, we can really push much harder and push um, to make even more groundbreaking break, elements. Um, I think technology is our friend and uh, I, we've really embraced it. I think other studios are definitely embracing it as well. Um, so I hope it continues. I hope we can continue to just kind of create these insane characters and really shock producers and shock directors on what we can really do and put it right in front of the camera. It's been done for many, many years. You know, I'm an alumni of Stan Winston. Um, Sam Winston Studios and uh, many other shops before this and it's been done we've been able to do amazing pieces in the past and I think we're just continuing to do that and if anything it's a it's a bigger evolution and we're creating I think better work now when the opportunity is, is given to us um, I think it, the sky's the limit at this point you heard it from Justin uh, Justin Raleigh, the CEO, Creative Director of Fractured Effects. The future for practical effects is bright. Thank you so much for speaking with us, Justin. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.